Well, good morning. Can I add my welcome to that of Daniel's? It's uh, lovely to see everybody. Uh, lovely to see you. Oh, I can't actually see you, but uh, I know you're there. Uh, wonderful to have you with us if you're watching online as well. But it's wonderful to be together in the building as well, and we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper uh, later on. Uh, but before that, we are going to be reading uh, 1 Corinthians 13 once again. And this is the final sermon in our series on that wonderful, uh, that great chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I should also say, just before we read it, um, Mark in his prayers prayed for Odette. Um, she is um, on a high dependency unit at the MRI uh, with COVID. She is uh, incubated. Um, oh, she's on a ventilator. So please, please, please pray for her and for her family. Um, do join us for one of the prayer meetings in Lent on a weekly basis, and we'll be uh, bringing her debt uh, before the Lord in prayer on a daily basis. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels... But have not love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I sport like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we've been in a series on Sunday mornings now for the past uh, five weeks looking at 1 Corinthians 13, this uh, great, this beautiful chapter about love. And we mustn't forget that this, actually, this, this chapter is actually a rebuke to the Corinthian church who weren't loving each other. They were very gifted, but they lacked love. And we're looking at this chapter because I want us to be a church that is known as a church of love. I want us to be people who love one another well and who are known in our community and in our city as a people who love one another well. And we need to work hard at that all the more at, in our current circumstances. As Becky was saying in the worship, one of the things about lockdown is it, it makes you, uh, it shrinks your world. And it, stops you looking outward. It hinders you doing that. It hinders you loving others. And so we need to fight for that. We need to work hard to do that. And for some of you, your world has shrunk, but it's shrunk in your home with people who you do find it hard to love. And so you need to work at that as well. Today we're finishing our, our series on love, and it's not without a bit of irony that it's Valentine's Day. But the love that Paul's talking about here is not romantic love, good as that is. But it's other-centered love. It's sacrificial love. It's, it's loving 
the other, looking out for the other. It's loving other people for who they are, not for what they bring. Now, in this final sermon, in this final section, verses 8 to 13 of 1 Corinthians 13, I want us to see something really important about love. I want us to see that love endures forever. That, that love never ends. One of the books I've been reading as I've been preparing uh, for these sermons is a book called Charity and Its Fruits. Charity is the, the old word which we have translated love here in the King James. It's charity never fails. Charity this. The book's called Charity and Its Fruits by Jonathan Edwards. And it's a series of lectures that he gave on this chapter. And the final lecture, he called Heaven is a World of Love, which is where we get the title for our sermon this morning. Because I want us to see this morning something important about love, and that is that heaven is full of it. Heaven itself is a world of love. And so there's three things about that I want us to see. First of all, that heaven is a world of love. Why heaven is a world of love? And then thirdly, how that applies to our lives now. So that heaven is a world of love. Why heaven is a world of love? And how that applies to our lives now. So first of all, that heaven is a world of love. Paul says this in verse 10. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. The perfect he's talking about there is a future world. The perfect is, as it were, the end of this world and the beginning of an, an, a new world. It is this world, but renewed and transformed. And he calls it the perfect. And that word perfect, there's two aspects to the meaning of that word. The first is, the word means complete or whole, as opposed to partial or imperfect. And the second meaning is that the perfect is the goal or the aim. And so Paul's saying this. He's saying that there is a world to come that is complete, that is perfect, that is the goal and the aim of this world. See, the world that you and I live in, this world is is incomplete, it's imperfect, it's partial, it's broken. It's in pieces, and it's in pieces because of our sin. You know, sin is what messes up this world, and it's what messes up uh, the world around us, it's what messes up your life and my life. See, sin hinders relationships. It, it brings relational dysfunction because what is sin? Well, sin is, we've been defining it as selfishness, as self-seeking, as, as self-absorption, as centering your world on yourself. And when you do that, what happens? Well, there's relational breakdown because we're all pushing ourselves forward and pushing other people away. You have arguments. You have broken relationships. You have loneliness. Because sin results in pushing other people away because you're saying, I come first. And they push you away because they say, I come first. And that prevents this world from being the place that we want it to be. It, it prevents us from, from this world from being whole, from being complete from being the place of belonging and acceptance and love that we want it to be. Do you ever feel that you are a fish out of water in this world? Well, that's because you are a fish out of water. Do you ever feel homeless? Do you ever feel like you don't belong? Well, that's because you don't belong. You see, you're not made for this world. There is a world to come. That's the aim. That's the goal of this world. That's what you were made for. That is where you will belong. That is where your home is. And Paul says that world is a world of love. He starts verse 8 by saying this. Love 
never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. You see, Paul is saying again here, as he did at the beginning of the chapter, love is greater than the greatest spiritual gifts, than the greatest abilities, than the greatest prophecies, and the greatest preaching and teaching. Because all gifts will end. They they will, as it were, fall apart. Because all gifts are a means to an end. The means to the end of getting you and me to heaven. The place where love will never end. You see, on judgment day, preaching will be at an end. What has a preacher got to say on judgment day when you're stepping into heaven? Heaven is a world of love. But also, Paul says in verse 13, that heaven that that love is greater than even faith and hope. He says this, he says, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, those are the three great virtues which appear again and again in the New Testament in Paul's writings, faith, hope, and love. But, But love is the greatest, Because love will never end. You see, the thing about faith is in heaven, faith will be assimilated into sight. You'll still have faith in that you will still thankfully trust God for who he is and for what he's done for you. But you won't need faith to see heaven like we need faith now because you'll be there. The same is true for hope. In heaven, hope will be absorbed into reality. You'll still need hope as a firm anchor in Jesus Christ. But you won't need hope as anticipation of heaven because you'll be there. But that's not the case with love. See, the thing about heaven is this. Whilst we experience love in part now, we will experience love in fullness then. See, faith and hope in, in some respects are like stabilizers that help us on our way to the world of love. So why is heaven a world of love? Well, first of all, it's because God is in heaven. God is there. Now you might say, well, isn't God everywhere, Jumpy? Well, yes, he is everywhere. But the Bible says that in some respects, he's more particularly in some places. That was true in the Old Testament where he said that he dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem. And the Bible everywhere says that God dwells in heaven. And so heaven is a world of love because God is there, and God is the fountain of love. He's the fountain of love, just like the sun is the source of life, so God is the source of love. God is love, and because he's an infinite God, he's an infinite fountain of love. Because he's an eternal being. He's that love, that fountain of love is eternal. And that love is other-centered love. Where where we will enjoy other people for who they are and they will enjoy us for who we are. People won't want to be your friend because you're useful to them. They will want to be your friend because of who you are. They will love you for who you are and you will love them for who they are. And the same is true with God. We will love God for who he is not for what we can get out of him. And he will love us. He will love you for who you are. See, that is what heaven's like. Heaven's like that now. You see, God is love because God is, if God was just one person, he could not be a God of love. Because he would need to create somebody in order to love. 
But you see, because God is Trinity, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He's able to love forever without needing you or me. He loves, the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Spirit. And the Spirit loves the Father. They love one another in an eternal relationship, as it were, an eternal dance of love. And you and I were created to join them in that relationship. That's what Jesus says in John 17, in his great prayer, the night before he died. He says this, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. See, what will happen when you enter heaven? You will, God's glory, you will see God's glory. God's glory will come upon you. God's love will come upon you. You will be, be overwhelmed, deluged, as it were, in that love of God. Your heart will be so full of that love that it will want to burst. See, that is what heaven is. And that is what you were created for. You were created to be there in that relationship of love forever and forever. And everything in this world now is pointing towards that. This world, the aim of this world, the goal of this world is, is, is that world to come is that relationship. And when you're there, you're at the center of everything. Let me ask you have, you, have you ever got joy and happiness out of music? Or out of dancing? Or out of a relationship? Out of marriage? Out of family? Out of friendship? Well, those things are, as it were, tasters. They're, 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 as it were, they are fulfilled in God himself. The joy that we get from those things comes from God and is completed in God. Those things are like shadows. God is the reality. Those things are like Rays of light in this world. God is the sun. Those things are like streams of water. God is the ocean. And and so when you get into heaven, you're, you're joining the ultimate song. You, you, you're, you're part of the ultimate dance. You're, you're, you're entering the ultimate relationship. The ultimate marriage. The ultimate friendship. The thing that you have been created for. And everything that you experience here and now. All the love that you experience here and now. Is pointing towards that. That that world of love. And it's a world of love because God is there. But it's a world of love because... You will see God face to face. Paul says that in verse 12. He says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Corinth produced um, well made bronze mirrors. It was one of the industries in the city. And what people would do is create a piece, of, you know, a piece of bronze and then they'd polish it until you could see yourself in it. And Paul is picking up on that and saying that our experience of, of God now is, is like looking through a mirror. That is, it's indirect. It's like... Um, it's like seeing a photograph of somebody. 
It's not the real thing. It's them, but it's not the real thing. When we see God in the scriptures, we are seeing God, but we're seeing God through the medium of the Bible. It's indirect. But also, it's, it's imperfect. It's like a riddle. It's not completely clear to us. But when perfection comes, then we will see God face to face. There'll be nothing between us. There'll be nothing to stop our vision of God. Our vision of God will be direct. It'll be immediate. We will see him. Just as Moses in Exodus saw God face to face, you will see God face to face. You may say, well, how can, how can I see God face to face? Because isn't God a spirit? That's right. You won't see God the Father face to face because God is a spirit. No one's ever seen God, but you will see Jesus Christ, God the Son. You will see him face to face. And you'll be like him when you see him. You see, our vision of God in heaven will be direct, but it'll also be perfect. It will be complete. That doesn't mean to say that you'll know everything there is to know about God because God's infinite. And you're not. And you never will be. And so for all eternity, you'll be discovering more things about God. That's one of the things that will make heaven interesting and exciting and ever more glorious. But your knowledge of God will be complete in that you will know what he has done for you. You will know the completeness and the fullness of his love for you. See, one of the issues here and now is we don't see, we don't know how much God loves us. Our sin hinders that. The world around us hinders that. We don't live with the reality of God's love at the forefront of our hearts and minds. You know, if, if you wrong somebody, what do you want to do? Well, often we want to avoid them. We don't want to see them. We don't want to see their face. And when we sin, that's true for us and God. We, we, we don't want to see God. We don't want to face God because we know we've wronged him. And so one of the things right from the beginning of creation is that from Adam and Eve is people have always been avoiding the face of God. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree that they shouldn't have eaten from in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what did they do? They went and hid themselves in the garden. Hid themselves from the face of God. And that's what we want to do. That's what we're always doing. And and the question then is, well, how on earth is it possible for us to see God face to face and not want to avoid him? How is it possible for us to stand in the presence of God in heaven and look Jesus Christ in the face? It's because of what Jesus Christ came and did for us here on earth. See, when Jesus Christ came to earth, what did he do? Well, he left his glory, the glory of heaven. He left, and what's the glory? The, it's the... He left that eternal glory in that eternal love and came to earth. And he lived his life here on earth, turning his back as he were on that glory and suffering for you and for me. And when he died on the cross, what happened? He lost the glory of God. He lost the love of God. He lost the face of God. That's why he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your face away from me? But he did that, saw that Jesus Christ could take upon himself all your sins, all the wrong things you've done, all the ways that you have wronged God. Jesus took those upon himself. He lost the face of God and was destroyed by God on the cross. So that you could be accepted by God and have the face of God forever. You see, Jesus Christ was cast out when he died on the cross so you could be welcomed in. 
He was forsaken so that you could be embraced. Isn't that what you want? Don't we want to be known and to be loved and to be embraced and to be accepted and to be welcomed home? Don't we want to be in a place where we belong and where we, where we fit forever? Where we are known for who we are? That's heaven. That's the world of love. You, in heaven, you will belong to God. You won't be your own. But he will belong to you. And in that relationship, forever, there will be joy. An infinite joy, which is greater than any joy you experience from any human relationship here. And there is quite a bit of joy from some relationships here and now. Sometimes people say to me, heaven just sounds so boring. And if your view of heaven is like a, a Simpsons cartoon where people are playing harps sitting on clouds, maybe. I don't want to diss harp players because they're very good and clouds are very nice and I'm sure are comfortable to sit on if you can get there. But, but if that's your view of heaven, then no wonder you kind of think about it as boring, but heaven's a world of love. And when you're those of you who've been in love know that when you're with someone you love, time just flies by. It's not boring. I remember when Jill and I first got married and we would spend hours just playing Connect Four and drinking Cherry Coke and talking. Like, people go, oh, that must have been just boring doing that. It's not boring. When you're with someone you love, nothing that you do is boring. You know, you, you're with someone you love, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm just going to go for a walk. What are you going to do? We'll just walk. It's not, it's not boring because you're with someone you love. And that's what heaven is like. You're with people that you love forever. And you will go for walks. And they're not boring. You'll play Connect Four. You'll drink Cherry Coke. There'll be rivers of it. Heaven is a world of love. And the greatest relationships here and now are, are, they're like dirty rags in comparison to a wedding dress compared to the relationships that we will have with each other and with God in heaven. Where you will be loved, you will be yourself, you will know yourself, you will know God, you will dance with him. You will be beautiful. Beautiful with the love of God. You will be, as it were, a flower in the garden of God. And the fragrance that you will emit will be love. So how does this apply to us today? So many ways. First one. First way this applies, it's quite simple. People are more important than possessions. Life is about relationships. They will continue forever because love continues forever. Your smartphone won't continue forever. But relationships will. And so how you treat other people is important. If you've got a decision to make between a person and your smartphone, the person wins. If you've got a decision to make between money or people, people win. If you've got a decision to make between any of your possessions and people, that relationship wins. Work on your relationships. But second, broken relationships in this world will cloud your vision of heaven. They will cloud your assurance of heaven. See, God is love, and so any anger, any lack of love, any conflict between friends or colleagues, any bitterness from any past mistreatment, it will affect your relationship with God. 
It, it will affect you. the reality of heaven. Your assurance of being in heaven. Your assurance of salvation. The comfort and joy you receive from God's love. Just as the Bible says that when a couple fall out, it hinders their prayers. Arguments in families hinder love there. When you can't face somebody because of a broken relationship, there's an issue there with God. It, it, it destroys your access to Him. It destroys your access to His love. And that's true for churches. You know, broken relationships in churches hinder the work of the Holy Spirit, hinder God's love. Irrespective of how gifted a church is, or how good the people in the church are, or how religious they are. What makes a church a church is not gifts. It's not doing good things. It's not saying prayers in all the right sort of way. The thing that makes a church a church is love. Love is the greatest evidence that heaven has invaded this world, has invaded the church. But third, if you are a Christian, you should be the happiest person in the world. Because you're on your way to heaven. You're on your way to the world of love. You've experienced the love of God in your heart. That's how you're born again. You're born again with this seed of love. A seed which will never perish. And you, you, you here on earth have experienced something of the love of God. And one day you know you'll experience it in its fullness. And that fullness of love will more than make up for all the troubles and suffering and difficulties and trials that you experience here and now. A second in heaven will make all the troubles and suffering of this life feel like one night in a bad hotel. Let me ask, have you, have you been rejected by friends or family? Do you know you're going to be fully accepted and welcomed in heaven? Are you being treated badly at the moment? Don't hate people back, but love in return because you know you'll receive in heaven love which will more than make up for any hatred that you've experienced here. Are you aware of dishonesty or injustice or people being treated badly? Well, stand up for that, even if it's going to cost you because you're not going to lose anything in the long term. Have you, have you been treated badly so that you've lost money or you've lost reputation? Don't turn in on yourself in self-pity. You're on your way to heaven where you're going to be crowned in glory and in love. You know, if you, if you know that you've got a million pounds in the bank and you lose a hundred quid. You'd be a bit of a fool if you were walked around feeling sorry for yourself. Well, you've got more than a million pounds in the bank of heaven. Don't turn in on yourself in self-pity when you're treated badly or when you lose things. You can be generous with what you've got. You don't need to defend yourself when you're attacked. You're going to be crowned in glory and love in the future. Are you anxious about the future? Are you anxious about COVID and what's going to happen after lockdown? Well, you don't need to be anxious about any of those things because your future is secure in heaven. That's where you're going. You can live a life of freedom and joy now. You've got nothing to worry about. But fourth, We've been talking about heaven, but 
as we reflect on it, we see how awful hell actually is. Hell's an awful, awful place. There's three worlds, ultimately. There's this world, which is a mixture of love and hatred. There is heaven, which is a world of love. And there is hell, which is a world of hatred. There's nothing good in hell. There's nothing loving in hell. It is a hateful place. It is a horrible place. It's as it were a den of snakes, of hissing snakes that are constantly biting one another and stinging one another. See, heaven is full of people who are other-centered, who love one another. Hell is full of people who are self-centered, who hate one another. Hell is full of envy and boasting and pride and rudeness and self-seeking and touchiness and self-pity and unrighteousness. You know, sometimes your people say, well, you know, I want to I, I want to I wanna go there because that's where my husband is. He won't be your husband in hell. I want to go there because that's where my mates are. We'll have a good time together. They won't be your mates. And you won't have a good time. If you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you need to see how awful hell is. Turn from it. Flee from it to God. Seek after heaven. You know, heaven is so beautiful and so wonderful. You and I should want to seek after it in our lives and do everything we can to be weary with this world that we live in and pursue heaven and have a passion for heaven. So finally, how do we do that? Well, we flee from temptations. Don't be tempted by the world around us. Even if the world around you seems attractive don't be tempted by it remember even the best things in this world are means to an end of getting you to heaven don't stop don't get off the bus flee temptations and focus on heaven one of the best ways to flee temptations is by considering where you're going if you're on the bus to heaven talk about heaven think about heaven Hang out with people who are going to talk about heaven with you, who are going to encourage you to stay on the bus, who are going to excite you with a passion for where you're going, for your destination. And as you do that, it will appear more real to you. When you have difficulties in this life, face them with courage. If you've got to go through lots of difficulties to get to heaven and lots of troubles and and trials, face them with courage because you know where you're going. You know, if, as it were, heaven is the top of a mountain, then the, the higher you go up the mountain, often the steeper it is, the more difficult it can be to climb. But the closer you are to the summit and the more aware of where you're going, you can sometimes see it. that encourages you to keep going and as you keep going fix your eyes on Jesus look to Jesus Christ look to Jesus Christ who is in heaven he's there and because he's there that's where you're going that's where you will be look to him look to his example of suffering through this world before he got to heaven look to his example and follow it Look to his sacrifice in your place. See that he was willing to die on a cross to get you to heaven. Look to his prayers. He's praying for you to get there. And look to his strength to help you get there. You're not going to make it by yourself, but he can give you the strength and the grace that will help you get to heaven. And finally, if you want to seek after heaven, Fill your life with heaven's love now. If you want a journey on that bus to heaven, then while you're on that bus, fill your life with love. 
Live a life of love. Love each other here at St. Clement's. Love others outside the community that they might want to get on the bus. If you live a life of love now, then you will experience something of heaven now because heaven is a world of love. You'll experience something of the joy of heaven now. The peace of heaven now. The harmony of heaven now. And it will be evidence and assurance to you that you're on your way to heaven. That world of love. Let me pray. Father, we know what it is to feel uh, like we don't belong here. Uh, and the reason for that is because you've made us for heaven. You've made us to be with yourself. Help us to seek after it. Give us a passion for it. Give us a longing to be in that world of love. And as we press on to it, make us people who love one another here and now that our church and our lives might be characterized by love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.